Hey guys, welcome back and thanks for joining me. I'm your host, Sherry. I've been off for the month of March. March is like a really bad time of the year for me and I usually become a recluse except for going to work. But I'm back now and we have a story to discuss. Today's story is about a young woman named Morgan Harrington who is a student at Virginia Tech University with dreams of becoming a teacher. Morgan was just 20 years old when she disappeared while attending a Metallica concert with friends. We will also discuss the tie-in to another case who is the young lady on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen with red hair. We'll get into her in a bit. As always, my sources are listed in the description area of the video. This is the case of Morgan Harrington. This story takes us back to 2009, which was more than a decade ago. It was the year the first Black American president was sworn in. What a historic moment that was. Every television station in the U.S. was switched from analog to digital. Uber was founded. I didn't realize Uber had been around that long. The best-selling car was the Chevy Malibu. Minimum wage was increased to $7.25 an hour. And former investment advisor Bernie Madoff was sentenced to 150 years in prison for conducting a massive Ponzi scheme. And lastly, Ego announced the frozen waffle sh shortage would continue for another year. Good times. When I first heard about Morgan Harrington, I just loved her. She loved heavy metal music, something that's always been a part of my life. I've been to a ton of metal concerts myself. She was born July 24th, 1989. Morgan had graduated high school early. She was at the top of her class with a 3.9 grade point average. At the time the story takes place, Morgan is a student at Virginia Tech University. She was close to her parents, Dan and Gil. She has a brother named Alex. They have a lavish home in Roanoke, Virginia, but Morgan lives in an off-campus apartment that she shared with a roommate that was very close to her college. Morgan liked going back to home to, you know, to mom and dad's on the weekends to drop off her laundry and get a, a good cooked meal. That was her real home, I guess you could say. She was basically a kid, and mom and dad's just adored her. I watched a lot of interviews with her parents, and they seem like a super sophisticated couple who are just very nice and just the kind of parents everyone would want to have. You know, I could do a whole story on Roanoke, Virginia, where they live. This is the place with the Lost Colony hundreds of years ago. Fascinating story if you want to look it up. So it's October 17th, 2009, and Morgan has plans to go with some friends to a Metallica concert at the John Paul Jones Arena in Charlottesville, Virginia. She had been looking forward to this concert for a while. Her ticket was printed and hung on the fridge at her parents' house for six months. The openers that night were Gohira and Lamb of God. I remember when this tour came around. It was called the World Magnetic Tour. Morgan was going to go to the concert and then come back to her parents, stay the night, and the next day, her and her dad were going to go over her finances. Her dad was going to teach her how to balance her checkbook and save money. He was also going to help her study for an upcoming math exam. Morgan gets ready for the concert. She wears a black Pantera shirt, a black mini skirt, and black leggings. And she comes downstairs to ask her mom how she looked. Her mom gave her some jewelry to wear, including a bracelet that was an old family heirloom and a diamond Swarovski necklace. I hope I pronounced that right. Swarovski? <laughs> I don't know. Morgan and her girlfriends arrive at the concert and everyone is super excited. Now, they are in Morgan's car and one of the other friends is going to be the designated driver. So she keeps Morgan's keys. They wait in the long line to get inside, and you guys know how this goes. You get patted down, you go through the metal detector, and then you got to try to locate your seat and navigate around 14,000 other people. The opening band, Gohira, is getting ready to take the stage, and Morgan tells her friends that she's going to go to the bathroom. Some time passes, and Morgan hasn't come back to her seat. But by now, they're worried because Gohira is going off, and Lamb of God is getting ready to go on, so she's already missed the, the first band. Morgan, for reasons unknown, had walked outside of the venue. No one can understand why. The bathrooms were clearly marked as well as the concession stands and the smoking area. She basically had no reason to go outside. Plus, there are signs everywhere that say no re-entry. Security also warns everyone who walks out that they will not be allowed back in the venue without purchasing a new ticket. This is pretty much standard operating procedure at every large arena. It's still early. It's about 8.30, 8.45 p.m. 
Her friends are really beginning to worry because Morgan is taking forever. One of the girls calls her and Morgan answers and says, hey, I'm outside and they won't let me back in. She tells her friends not to worry about her and that she will find a cab or some way to get home. Enjoy the concert. Take my car back home. I'll find a way. Morgan is obviously upset, but doesn't really have a choice. I know that we all feel her friends should have met her at the door and given her the car keys so she could have at least sat in the car until the end of the concert, but we won't get into that. I'm sure these girls live with a lot of guilt over this night and never in a million years would have thought that their friend Morgan was going to go missing. So Morgan, being this young blonde girl wearing a black miniskirt, is left outside the venue and she's all alone. It's also October, so I imagine it's pretty cold outside. I struggle wondering why Morgan went outside in the first place. We don't know why she would have thought that was a good idea. Her friends think she went outside to smoke a cigarette, even though there were signs posted on how to get to the designated smoking area that didn't involve going out the front doors. I think she clearly just didn't comprehend the signs that read no entry. Morgan was warned by staff that if she went outside, she wouldn't be allowed back in. Morgan's only 20 years old, and I remember being that young and oblivious to a lot of things. I'd be in tears if I heard this concert going on without me. At this point, she should have just called her parents. These were two loving parents who did everything for Morgan. They would have dropped everything and came and gotten her. Her friends say she had been drinking, but not enough to go stumbling outside. However, a few have said that Morgan appeared to be under the influence of something. I read multiple reports that Morgan was acting erratically or bizarre, including dumping her purse out on the ticket booth counter. She was also walking up to random people and just starting conversations. Police have confirmed that there was no plans to meet back up with her friends. She was basically just like, hey, I can't get back in. I'm going to find a way home and go lay in my bed and cry because I'm missing the concert. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. I know you all are wondering about security cameras, but Morgan wasn't on any of them except for the ones where she was talking to security trying to get back inside the venue. She had gone around to several different entrances and had tried each one. It could be that she was missed on other cameras because you have to remember there are 14,000 people at this event and this is a huge arena. It's been noted that Morgan was seen standing in this grassy knoll area next to the parking lot. Around 9.20 p.m., a father and daughter were traveling past the John Paul Jones Arena. This dad is going to drop his daughter off at her college dorm. Well, they say that they spotted a young woman with long blonde hair wearing a black miniskirt and a Pantera shirt hitchhiking on a bridge near the stadium. They thought it was strange because it was raining and she was standing out there with no umbrella. Well, this dad drops his daughter off and then he goes to the 7-Eleven and comes back the same way he came. He crosses the bridge he had just crossed less than 15 minutes before. The young woman was no longer there and she wasn't anywhere in the area. Two other witnesses claim to have seen a woman matching that description hitchhiking on the bridge around the same time. This narrows the time of Morgan's disappearance to between 9.20 p.m. and 9.35 p.m. All of these witnesses were vetted and cleared by police. When Morgan fails to come home, her parents assume the next morning that she stayed out with friends. Although they're annoyed, this is a best case scenario. Remember, Morgan is supposed to spend the day with her dad studying for her math exam and learning how to balance her checkbook. They call her friends and her friends explain what happened the night before and how Morgan wasn't allowed back in the arena and she was going to find a ride home. Morgan's parents call police and Morgan is now officially a missing person. Morgan's purse containing her school ID, an empty flask, and her cell phone were located in the RV lot of the University of Virginia Athletic Stadium, which was about one mile from the John Paul Jones Arena. Her cell phone had its battery removed. Police are asking anyone with any info, no matter how small, to please come forward. They want to know if anyone spoke to her that night. There is a $100,000 reward at this time for anyone who can find Morgan. Morgan's father, Dan, tells the media they will not stop until she is found. Dan, at this time, receives a phone call and is surprised to hear who was on the other end. It was James Hetfield, the longtime lead singer and guitarist from Metallica. James Hetfield tells him that he is so sorry that Morgan disappeared from their concert. James says that they are all dads themselves and that he and his band feel awful. 
This is admirable because bands don't want bad publicity. They could have very easily gone home to their mansions and dis- you know, distanced themselves from the situation. But instead, James put out a public service announcement on Metallica's website asking for any info locating Morgan. They also placed her missing persons flyer on the front page of their website. They put in the work as well as fully cooperated with the FBI. James tells Dan that Metallica will add $50,000 in reward money to anyone who can locate Morgan. Morgan's parents, Dan and Gil, say Metallica was not liability-driven or trying to protect themselves. They were genuine, and they wanted to do anything in their power to help find Morgan. I always knew these were good guys who cared deeply for their fans, but this definitely solidifies it. In fact, I've been spinning Metallica's catalog a lot while researching this case. It definitely helps to feel more of a connection. In November 2009, this is one month after Morgan went missing. The case seems to be not really going anywhere. It was revealed that a black Pantera shirt, similar to the one that Morgan had been wearing that night, was found. A student of the University of Virginia was walking back from class near his apartment complex and saw the shirt laying in the bushes. He says he walks there every day, and it definitely wasn't there before. It's laying sprawled open on the bushes. This shows us this criminal who put it there was cocky and just being an ass. He wants to make it clear that he hasn't been caught yet. The shirt was tested and Morgan's DNA was on it. This is 100% the shirt she was wearing that night. They also found another person's DNA on it. They don't have a match for this DNA, but it shows that it belongs to a male. It was also the exact same DNA that matched two rape cases a few years prior. They don't have the identity of the DNA yet, but there was also a dog hair on the shirt. It was compared to the dog that belonged to Morgan's family, and it wasn't a match. So this dog hair came from the abductor, or it it came from one of her girlfriends she was with that night. Maybe it rubbed off and clung to Morgan's shirt. We don't know where this random dog hair came from. Police and the FBI have followed up on over 1,000 individual tips. They are exhausted. The family wants answers. And most importantly, Morgan needs to be found and someone needs to be held accountable. Then on January 26, 2010, this is a little over three months since Morgan disappeared. A farmer named David Das was checking his fence line along his 750-acre property. There had been some bad storms in the area over the last week, and he was just surveying for any damage. When he stumbles across something that makes him gasp, he sees the remains of a young body laying on his land. At first, he thought this was a deer carcass. This body has been laying in in the elements for months and was badly decomposed. This property is about 10 miles from the arena where Morgan disappeared. It's a remote farm one and a half miles from the road, and to get to the location where this body was disposed was really difficult. The skull was examined, and it was determined via dental records that these were the remains of 20-year-old Morgan Harrington. Morgan's dad receives a phone call, and it was a reporter on the other end. The reporter asks if he'd like to give a statement regarding the finding of his daughter's remains. Dan is like, what? I seriously cannot believe that this was the way that Dan found out about his daughter's body being found. Can you imagine? Morgan's mother, Gil, says, for the first time in 101 days, I am not thinking every minute, what is he doing to my daughter now? What is he doing to her? What is she having to endure? Morgan's father, Dan, says, and this is heartbreaking, Who would have ever thought it would be mine to see every image of Morgan's life from her first faint shadows on a fetal ultrasound to the gaping orbital hollows in her skull, an abomination to witness this ending. The cause of death was not released by police, but it's come out that Morgan was raped and then beaten to death. She had broken bones and this was a brutal attack. Her parents say they can switch their focus from finding Morgan to finding out how she got there, and more importantly, who put her there, who raped and murdered this promising young woman. On February 5th, Morgan is laid to rest. A large funeral takes place, and then her parents travel to East Africa to scatter her ashes. They also traveled to the Outer Banks to spread more of her ashes, since that was a place Morgan loved to take vacations with her family. It took three and a half months to locate Morgan's body, 
but she was found. Now we are on to finding her killer, and to get us to that point, we're going to have to wait a few years, and we're going to skip ahead to September 2014. This is five years since Morgan disappeared. There is an 18-year-old young lady named Hannah Graham. She is the girl on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Hannah Graham is a student at the University of Virginia. Now, Hannah is not originally from the U.S. She was born in Berkshire, England in 1996. Hannah is a really good piano player, and she's involved in sports and also Habitat for Humanity, just a really amazing person. She is an only child, and her parents just doted on her. Hannah disappeared on September 12th, 2014. She had attended a house party and then wandered out alone and drunk down this pedestrian mall in Charlottesville, Virginia. She's texting a bunch of her friends, but they were getting harder and harder to understand. One of the last texts that she sent said she was walking and lost. There is a man named Jesse Matthew who is out partying in these bars in the area. Jesse works at a hospital, and earlier that day, he was coaching a football team in the area. You can't miss him. He's this large, tall black man with really long dreadlocks. He's a really good football player, but he was kicked off of two teams while in college due to sexual assault allegations. Well, on this particular night, Jesse had been harassing women throughout the evening. He's groping women in bars and just being an ass. A few women said he was really freaking them out, including reaching up their skirt. Around 1 o'clock a.m., he gets thrown out of this bar he's in called The Tempo. This is the third or fourth bar he's been in that night. He walks out to his car, and he sees a young lady named Hannah Graham walking alone down the street. Surveillance cameras spot Jesse walk past Hannah and then turn around and walk back to her. A witness sees him put his arm around her, and he says, Hey, man, what are you doing? Jesse tells him to hush. Jesse and Hannah walk to this bar, and he buys her and himself a drink. They walk back out, and Hannah is so drunk she can barely walk, and Jesse has his arm around her. She doesn't even probably realize that this is a complete stranger, and she probably just thinks he's just some guy being friendly. He tells her to get in the car with him. She yells, no, I'm not getting in the car with you. This witness kept walking and turned around a moment later, and both were gone. Hannah was reported missing, and there is a $100,000 reward for her return. Jesse's co-workers say the days following Hannah's disappearance, he seemed to be acting odd. I've heard of killers doing this. A lot of times when the FBI profiles a killer, they tell people to watch for someone displaying these signs. Jesse was arriving to work late, not acknowledging anyone when he got there. He was being out of character, such as just being really quiet. He also complained of a toothache and a swollen jaw. One week after Hannah goes missing, investigators discover the identity of the man who was with her that night. That man is Jesse Matthews. They get a warrant to search his car and his apartment. A swab of Hannah's DNA was found on the passenger side door, as well as a pair of Jesse's shorts were found with both Hannah's DNA and his DNA on them. He's still not under arrest because they need more evidence to tie him to her. As far as they can tell, she could have just been a voluntary passenger in his car and now she's just missing. Jesse gets a new driver's license that day because he says his is lost and then he withdraws his money from the bank. Jesse, the next day, shows up to the police station and asks for a lawyer. He's still not under arrest and is free to go whenever he wants. He leaves the police station quickly. Three days later, Jesse is named an official person of interest in Hannah's disappearance. And Jesse was located 1,300 miles away near his sister's house in Galveston, Texas. He was camping on the beach. So let's go back to the Morgan Harrington case. Do you guys remember when Morgan's shirt was found and there was this unknown male DNA on it. The DNA was also linked to rapes in the area from years before. That unknown DNA belonged to Jesse Matthews. Jesse was Morgan's killer. Remember that unknown dog hair that was found on Morgan's shirt? It was compared to Jesse's dog named Popcorn, and it was a match. Jesse's phone records indicated he was in the area that Morgan was in the night she went missing at the Metallica concert. It all makes sense if you think about it. Remember, Morgan was hitchhiking. Well, 
Jesse was a cab driver at this time. He likely pulled over and offered her a ride. She sees it's a cab driver, so she gets in not knowing that this man was a killer. One month after Jesse's arrest, his lawyer submits a plea deal for 25 years in prison in exchange for admitting to Morgan and Hannah's murders, and he would tell police where Hannah's body was hidden. Both families met in Roanoke to discuss the plea deal, but it was never accepted. It was a good thing it wasn't accepted because within weeks afterwards, Hannah's remains were located without any assistance from her killer. Hannah was found five miles from where Morgan's remains were found five years earlier, this time on an abandoned property. She, like Morgan, had been beaten, raped, and brutally attacked. The crop top that Hannah was wearing that night was found inside out. Her pants were found with one leg inside out. Hannah's underwear, shoes, and cell phone were never located. Jesse Matthews would be indicted on Hannah Graham's murder, Morgan Harrington's murder, and also for an attack on a woman in 2005. He is going down for all three. Prosecutors are seeking the death penalty, which in Virginia is completely legal at the time. However, the death penalty was abolished in Virginia in March of 2021. Currently, there are only 27 states that have the death penalty. In March of 2016, Jesse formally enters a guilty plea confessing to the murders of Hannah Graham and Morgan Harrington. He is given a life sentence in exchange for accepting certain conditions. The conditions are that there will be no chance for early release. Jesse will not be eligible for parole and will relinquish any possibility of geriatric release, meaning he's only like 37 right now, but you know, if he's 98 years old, he won't be released just because he's old and dying or whatever. He will serve four separate life sentences. Both Morgan and Ham- and Hannah's families are pleased with the outcome of him just pleading guilty and saving them from a long, drawn-out trial, which would involve a lot of details about what happened to the two girls. Hannah's father says... Our overriding priority was that Jesse will never be able to again inflict his depravity on young women. Jesse's deeds showed that he is far too dangerous to ever be allowed to be free. His evil deprived the world of a great talent, but Hannah's enduring gift to us all is that she enabled this wicked man to be apprehended and convicted. She did change the world, but at a terrible price. Morgan's mother's statement was, For six and a half years, you were all determined and resolute to find the top-tier predator that hunted in this community. That process has been successfully completed today. Your dedicated efforts were incredibly helpful and sustaining for us personally. They say it takes a village to raise a child. I know it takes one to bury a child. There were multiple other women in the Virginia area that have gone missing or had their remains found, and we can't clear Jesse Matthews as a suspect. He could have very well committed these other rapes and murders and just hasn't gotten caught yet. He has also been linked to multiple other sexual assaults. This guy just needs to be buried under the prison at this point. I'm so glad he's off the streets and unable to harm anyone else. Twelve women from Liberty University have filed a lawsuit accusing the university of overlooking cases of sexual assault. Jesse's name was mentioned in the lawsuit, and he was accused of sexually assaulting a 15-year-old girl in 2000. The girl was only able to get free because she bit him really hard on the hand while he was strangling her. She reported the assault to campus police, and they dismissed her. One of them even joked about getting Jesse's autograph because it could be worth money someday. They believe she made the whole thing up and even mentioned she could be expelled for making up such a heinous story. Jesse Matthews is incarcerated at Sussex State Prison, but in December 2020, he was moved to a hospital in Richmond due to having stage 4 colon cancer. Both sets of parents were alerted that he was being transferred, but he would be under the control of Virginia Department of Corrections. The weird thing is that I can't find any other info about him after December 2020. I don't know if he died or if he's still in the hospital or if he was cured and brought back to regular prison again. I have no idea. If he's still alive, he's only 41 years old, so he still has a ways to go before he will likely die in prison of old age. 
One thing I found admirable and classy was Morgan's mother approached Jesse's mother during one of his court appearances. She told reporters, quote, I looked his mother in the eyes. I told her I understood this was very difficult on their family as well. I gave her my condolences and I shook her hand. It was the right thing to do. She was surprised and she was receptive, end quote. I'm telling you guys now, she is a better woman than me because I don't know if I could have done the same in her situation. Metallica funded a $50,000 scholarship in Morgan's name, and Morgan's parents started a scholarship that raised $400,000 to go to a future doctor to help get through medical school. As well, an educational wing in Zambia, Africa is now named for Morgan. Morgan's parents are victim rights advocates and are trying to change the world. Morgan's mother, Gill, says, We have lost so much, but we have been blessed in equal measure. But you have to be willing to accept the blessings that come to you instead of tip them out because you want what you once had. I can totally understand what she means by that. I swear to God I can. Hannah's parents said, Hannah simply lit up our lives. She was friendly, funny, loyal, bright, and she was a pleasure to hang out with and on a personal level. I miss it every day. She was really a force of nature. She was always on the go. She was always active and she was always contributing positively. Hannah was buried in Alexandria, Virginia. They continue to visit their daughter's grave every single week. She was their only child and their heartbreak is unfathomable. There's a 48 hours episode dedicated to Hannah's case. It's called Deadly Connections. I haven't watched it, but I plan to one of these days. If alive today, Morgan would be 33 years old and Hannah would be 26 years old. That's it for this week. Rest in peace to both Morgan and Hannah, two amazing young women who were just starting their lives. As always, my sources are listed in the description area of the video. Take care and much love to you all.